This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme sound. Uh, we are now in public session. Uh, members, we have a quorum, and uh, I would welcome you to today's meeting of the Public Accounts Committee. Members, mobile phones must be set to airplane mode uh, or on silent or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent mode as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. Uh, this session is being recorded on video and audio and can be assessed via online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. Uh, so we are now in public session and agenda, uh, agenda item one is apologies. I don't think there are any apologies, am I right? Everyone here? Okay. And agenda item two is the minutes of the meeting of the 17th of September, with pages six to ten of your pack. Uh, are members content that I sign these minutes? Please. Okay. Thank you. Um, members, at each of the meetings, uh, we are required to register relevant financial or other interests in the register of members' interests. Do any members have any interests they wish to declare this afternoon? Mr Muir. Previously employee of TransLink and a member of Ards North Down Borough Council. Okay. And also add on to that my stepfather's quality manager of the uh, A6. Okay. Um, agenda item four then, Ma uh, matters arising from those minutes, any matters arising? Okay, well we continue to remain in public session. Uh, agenda item five is correspondence, pages 14 to 28. Members are referred to a member received the 18th of September 2020, page 14 of your pack for the Health Committee regarding the evidence session on the 21st of May 2020 on addiction services. The official report, COVID-19 Disease Response Addiction Services, dated the 21st of May 2020, is also attached uh, to this memo at pages 15 to 28 of your pack. Members of the Health Committee intend to look into the matters uh, uh, of addictions again in the future and will welcome updates from the Public Accounts Committee on their inquiry. Members content? Great. Okay. Okay. Agenda item six then is inquiry into the land web project and digital transformation. Briefing session, pages 29 to 148. At this stage, I'd like to invite Ms. Sue Gray, the Accounting Officer of the Department of Finance, and Mr. Paul Duffy, the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Finance, to the table, Mr. Ian Snowden, Chief Executive of Land and Property Services, also remotely attending. I'm also inviting Mr. Karen Donnelly. Um, uh, who uh, will be attending uh, in his role as Controller and Auditor General, and remotely, Mr. Stuart Stephen, Treasury uh, Officer of Accounts. Mr. Don Mr. Donnelly will stay for the remainder of the business. Okay. Broadcasting, can you please bring Mr. Snowden and Mr. Stevens in Stevenson into the meeting? They can see, hear, and be heard when speaking. Mr. Snowden, Mr. Steams, can you hear us? Uh, yes, can. Mr. Steams, can you can you you're muted? I think at the moment. Can... Yes, chair, I can hear good. the proceedings. Okay, good. We're good to go. Thank you very much. Um, okay, and I just remind witnesses that we have to continue to uh, adhere to social distancing. Um, so, good afternoon. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, Ms. Gray, Mr. Duffy, um, Mr. Snowden, Mr. Stevenson, and um, at this stage, I'll uh, hand over to you to make some comments, yeah. um, and then we'll take some questions from members. Okay. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me and for the opportunity to provide evidence on the audit office's reports um, on the NI Direct Strategic Partner and Landweb. Um, at the outset, I'd like to say that both from my current role in the Department of Finance and my previous role in the Cabinet Office, I'm really aware of how important digital transformation is for public services. It opens up opportunities to make services more efficient and deliver cost savings, but more importantly, it's what the public expect and deserve. And I think you know we've seen a lot of the benefits of that in the most recent, uh, with the most recent restrictions. People increasingly expect to be able to interact with public services online, 
uh, through easy to use solutions at times that suit them and we're, this, is, this is what we are doing, moving in this direction. Some good work uh, has been done in Northern Ireland. The reports we're here to talk about today uh, drive quite different, uh, cover quite different projects, which have delivered some real improvements in public services. However, the reports also shine light on some things which could and should have been done better. It's absolutely right that there's public scrutiny of these weaknesses so that we can learn how to do things better in current and future projects. I'm very clear that we have a responsibility to make the best possible use of public money. I talk a lot in the department about treating every taxpayer's pound in the same way we would treat our own pound, and I very much believe that. Um, since I've taken up post in 2018, I've challenged both my own department and our suppliers to change the way things are done, to ensure we get better value for money out of our contracts. I've set up a strategic contract management team in the department with the aim of bringing a stronger commercial focus to our discussions with suppliers. I'm using uh, the expertise that my former colleagues in Cabinet Office have, and many of the lessons from these and previous reports are being applied and are informing our approach to managing and negotiating the terms of contracts. The reports also illustrate some of the challenges that come with managing complex IT projects, and these challenges aren't just unique to here, but they are seen in other jurisdictions as well. As I said, we've been making greater use of our contacts in the Crown Commercial Service, Government Digital Service, and other UK organisations to learn from their experience. Um, I think we've had some challenges about the way we're funded. 12 months uh, you know, funding cycles actually are not great, but I'm hopeful that we will get multi-year budgets uh, in the, the, next, the next round. And I very much work in a way, and I hope my co colleagues in the NIAO will agree, I work in a very open way. I don't have secrets from the NIAO. In fact, I've involved them heavily in our deep dives that we have done in the department. And I think the department is in a different place. Um, we have you know, a strategic co contract management system, so we see all our contracts now well before they, uh, they're due to expire. And uh, I've appointed a commercial director in the department to take that overview of all of our contracts. So we are in a different place, but it's quite right that we're here today to be uh, you know, answering some questions about these contracts. And uh, happy to take it from there. Okay, any of your colleagues want something to add? No? Okay. Think at this stage. Okay, thank you very much, um, Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair, and very welcome, Mr. Duffy, and Ms. Craig. Good to see you. Um, <clears throat> the first time that a driver of a vehicle has dealings with DVA and I direct their first license application, like their L provisional, and when they go onto the website, this cannot be carried out. Just wondering why this can't be done here as a cost. Have we not got the technology? <coughs> as it can be done in other jurisdictions, and it's not new or impossible. Would it not be important that at the first stage on a driver's ladder that it should be pleasant, easy to follow process, creating <coughs> confidence in the department rather than disappointment or confusion? Thank you. Okay, well, luckily my, uh, my colleague here, Paul, uh, has joined the department fairly recently from DVA. <laughs> Brilliant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So just yeah, it is an issue uh, in terms of uh, you know a plan for a new uh, driving license. Um, the DVA has went through quite a significant um, transformational program in terms of putting a number of its key frontline services online, and, and that includes a number of the driving license and transactions that would take place. So you can go online and change your address, update um, your details in terms of if you want a duplicate license, you can renew, renew a license on, online. The challenge with the plan for a new licence is that uh, for that licence to be processed, the DVA has to assure itself that you are the person who you say you are. So there's an issue around identity assurance. Um, so there is work ongoing. Um, so within DOF, we've been doing some work on the Northern Ireland identity assurance process, which allows individuals to have their identity assured. And to do that, what, unfortunately, what ha has to happen is the individual has to come into into, uh, into a workplace with um, documentation to identify who they are. That has to be verified, and then that allows them then to go and use certain services. The difficulty with a driving licence is you tend to only apply for it once every 10 years. 
um, and therefore encouraging people to come in and have that identity assurance done isn't necessarily something they want to do if it's something they are only going to ever use once in every 10 years. So the system within DVA still needs to sort of develop a new a way of assuring somebody's identity, but we're working very closely with them on that for the next generation of their, of their solutions. Okay, thank you. And what about other, or other parts that can do it? Have they got different technology than we have? Or? Yeah, well, there's, there's, there's different levels of assurance. So if you wanted to access some services, you only need a level two insurance. Assurance, if you need to access some, some other services, you need a higher level of assurance. Um, uh, the driving licence required the highest level of, of assurance. Um, within GB, they use a, an identity assurance process called Verify. Um, it's not widely used by all services, but it is something that they have been, they have been progressing over a number of years. And I know DVA have certainly been in very close, in, uh, close engagement with um, the government digital services about potentially using that uh, as, a, as a means for assuring identity. Um, have they had any problems with Verify, or is it fairly reliable? Yes, there's been issues with Verify, um, and the take-up of it hasn't been spectacular for, for, for a number of GB departments, um, and, and there are a number of different assurance mechanisms that can be used. So some departments use one mechanism, some use the other. The difficulty is, for citizens, they really only want to use one. And I think getting that common identity assurance is, is, is where the real challenge lies. And Verify, um, when I was in the Cabinet Office, Verify was one of those projects that was uh, under underway for many, many years. Um, it actually started around uh, 2010, and I think it's only recently that it's really started to be rolled out. Cost an awful lot. They've, they've invested very, very heavily in it. Um, but as uh, Paul has said, you know, not all departments are using it. So, for example, I don't think DWP are using it. Um, so a number of departments aren't using it. In a way, we can learn from what they have been doing and actually, you know, take that on uh, more, more recently. And, and Tara, it is, I suppose that identity assurance is probably one of the biggest game changers for digital transformation. I think if, if that can be resolved, and that opens the gateway to many services for citizens. And so I, it's certainly an area that I know that the UF are, are looking at uh, in conjunction with GDS. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just ask, in relation to NI Direct, when was that contract signed? The contract was signed in 2012. Mm. How long for? It was originally signed, it was a seven year contract uh, with an option to extend for three years. And the estimated cost when it was signed in 2012 was? It was £50 million. Pounds. Mr Duffy, we received a, a briefing from the Audit Office last week, and there are a number of things in that briefing that were caused us grave concern. First of all, officials in the Department of Finance, I understand, thought the contract was 10 years, not seven, uh, and that the cost, the final cost of this um, project, which was £50 million pounds estimated, ended up being, I think, £110 million. Pounds. Yes. Um, the We're not in a position to lecture mainland departments about efficiencies and, and, and so on. How can we get to the point where we overspend by £60 million pounds on a contract that the department didn't understand the time period for? Well, I, th I think in terms of the contract, the forecast spend, Charlie, you're correct, is... Uh, forecast to be £110 million pounds by the end of 2022. Um, there were obviously uh, weaknesses in the department's internal controls around um, financial management and, and cost controls. Um, they were un that was un entirely unacceptable. <coughs> and the department has taken a number of steps to address those issues. Um, I think at the time the contract was being used, um, the it, it almost became a victim of its own success in that the amount of work that was going through that contract was greater than what had been anticipated, and, I, and there wasn't tight enough financial controls. I can assure you that those financial controls are now in place. Um, I could tell you how much has been spent in that contract to date, to the very penny. Um, we, we, we are meticulously um, uh, over, uh, monitoring those costs um, and reporting them, uh, and ensuring we stay within that 110. Uh, million pound limit. 
Could the audit Northern Ireland Audit Office not go into the department on an annual basis? They would have done a financial audit um, mm -hmm. on the department's accounts on an annual basis. And, and were these not flagged up on an annual basis, these overspends, projected overspends? I think the, the issue was flagged up um, in the 2016-17 financial accounts by the Audit Office, um, and, and it has been flagged up in uh, an internal audit report. And, and what was done in 2016-17 to rectify the situation? Well, I think at that time, um, what was done was a team that was looking after the contract um, clearly didn't have the, the skills that were required, the financial management skills to manage that contract. Um, there was a resource then um, brought in to um, check those costs and to ensure they were properly monitored. So the department did devise a, a tracking system um, at, around that time, which um, has been built on over the last uh, number of years and is now providing the information that we need. So the tracking required. system was introduced when, uh, Mr. Duffy? Quite recently. This is for, the, for the financial information, the tracking system, I think, was brought in around about 2017 is, is when it was first started okay, to be used, so, but so it was a bit of an iterative process in terms of refining so it. it. It took five years to put the tracking system in place. Chair, I, I, I couldn't excuse why it took that long to track the information. To be fair, you would have expected the, 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 the spend to be tracked from day one. Um, you would. Would. And I, I suspect it was tracked from day one, but actually the, the control of it was lost at some stage. Are you aware that um, when audit office officials spoke to a senior official in your department around these issues, and it was advised that the figure was going to be closer to 110 as opposed to 50 million pounds, the response of that individual was, "So what?" I couldn't. I yeah. Comment. I, I have to say, Chair, you know, uh, uh, talk about what you know in a way that would not be how we would behave. No. Um, and I can absolutely give that assurance. Well, we so an account contract is signed in 2012, and tracking system is introduced five years later on a contract. Whenever the audit office advises that it that that the the protections the scrutinies. Uh, whatever or not in place, and it takes five years for that to be done, and the projected spend at the end of this contract, which the department understood to be ten years when it was in fact seven, is more than double. Sixty million pounds spent out of the Northern Ireland budget, when you know could build six, eight primary schools, and that money is is gone. Sure. To, to the Northern Ireland budget, because there's a cost to this, Mr Duffy, of £60 million overspend, but there's also an opportunity cost to Northern Ireland PLC and other investments that would have been taking place. Chair, sure, I suppose I think it's important to clarify that this £110 million contract of value, there is an, the, there's a £60 million overspend against the value of the contract. Mm -hmm. It's not that something was bought, was intended to be bought for £50 million, and end up costing £110 million, pounds, with that additional £60 million pounds that has went through the contract. And, and, and I do not so, so defend the, yeah. the, the No, no, accept, accept the point you're making. There were lots of other services sure. delivered with that £60 yeah. million. Pounds. But, but then the question has to be asked those who negotiated the contract, those who signed off on the contract, clearly didn't dot I's and cross T's. And the, the, the ironic thing is, as a public representative, and all members will be the same. When we're lobbying for money for our constituencies, other departments will tell us business case has to go to be signed off by the Department of Finance, economists and Department of Finance. And here's the, the and, and before bringing other members, let me just make this point. If you look at Land Web, I think the, the original contract was signed for forty nine million pounds. Is that correct? Um, I'll have to Mr Snowden, is that correct? On this issue. You're on mute, Mr. Snowden. You'd have to unmute yourself. Yep, sorry. Um, yes, the original contract, I think, was 46 million. 46. My understanding is that Land Web could end up costing £107 million to the public person in Northern Ireland. Is that correct? Um, the total value of all the payments made under the contract could, could end up at around that figure, yes. So, NI Direct contract estimated £50 million, potentially signed, agreed by the department. 
2012 overspend £60 million, Land Web <coughs> contract £46 million, and it's going to cost £107 million. Now, I think members would be absolutely justified in asking the question, is there a culture in the department that these things, laissez-faire attitude, so what attitude? Because this is very stark reading for the public person in Northern Ireland, I have to say. As accounting officer, Ms. Gray, I know you, and I accept you weren't there at the time, but can I ask you, is there a culture? And I'm pre predicting knowing your answer. What are you doing to address it? Okay, so definitely not. There is, there is not that culture in the department. What have we done to address it? Um, since I've arrived, and to be fair to Paul, uh, you know, Andy, and none of us were actually. Uh, in place at the time that these contracts were negotiated and signed. But, you know, um, what we have done is, first of all, when I arrived, there were a number of audit and risk committees in the department. So rather than there being one audit and risk committee, there were several. Um, and issues from those audit and risk committees were not often... Uh, had the departmental audit and risk committee did not necessarily have visibility. So there is now one departmental audit and risk committee that is getting reports from the, from the various sections. Um, as I said, you know, uh, when I arrived, we didn't have a, a, a list of all of our contracts in the department or when they were due for, for, for expiry. We have now got that. We have now got a contract management system um, that actually... Uh, you know, details every contract, shows when it's due for, for, for expiry, very importantly, has the original cost and actually tracks expenditure. It actually tells us who the project manager or the SRO is so we can see the capability if people are actually managing more than they perhaps should be managing. And we have those discussions at our board and we now, that system, um, which we've been piloting really in DOF, we've been, we've been working it, is actually now going to be rolled out to other departments. I think that is actually either in play or underway. So very, very different. I am not afraid to stop projects um, if I think you know, either we haven't got the money or it's not going to be value for money. Um, I think the culture is very different, or it's a, you know, it's a strong culture now about you know, not wasting public money, not that I think people, I don't think people necessarily wasted public money, um, but that's, that's where we are. So I, you know, I think it's, it feels different. When, when you say there's a strong culture now, yeah. um, and I understand you came to Northern Ireland Civil Service from, from mainland yeah. Imperial Civil Service, does that suggest that there wasn't a strong culture? I don't These know, contracts were negotiated well, and the management well, of them? What I would say is that I think what I have been able to bring is experience from the Cabinet Office of how we, you know, yeah. the functions, the professionalisation of our staff uh, that was happening there. We've, you know, we, we run assessment centres here now. I've said I've, I've appointed a commercial director. You know, a lot of the contracts we are working with, there are, issue, there are things you can learn, you can apply that practice elsewhere. Um, and I think that's what the commercial director is bringing. We're also involved, the Cabinet Office Complex Transactions team, um, you know, their commercial relationship managers. We're using uh, everything we can to try to get the <coughs> value for money. But, but my question was, yeah. your, your words, strong culture now. Well, I can, I can speak yes. about but, what... But, the, but, the, but, the, but the, the fact that you've talked about what you and colleagues have now put in place. This, this committee, the people of Northern Ireland, would be absolutely justified in reaching the conclusion that there wasn't a strong culture in place. In fact, it was a laissez-faire, couldn't care less attitude. I don't, I, well, well here's, two, here's two contracts, and a senior official in your department says, so what? I don't think, I think, you know, if I look at this, if I look at the NI Direct and we did a deep dive, so, you know, the other thing we do in the department now is uh, we use our departmental audit and risk committee to have deep dives into projects. And the deep dive meeting is just covering one project. It will cover one project, lengthy discussion, the non-execs are there, the NIAO are there, internal audit are there, and we stress test that project. Um, I think with this project, the individual that was managing it was actually, I believe, you know, doing his best, 
Um, I think the project, the resources, you know, needed probably, there probably needs to be more resource. And as you know, we split how the contract was managed. Um, and so it, it's a different way of working. Sure, if I could maybe just add, yeah. you know, during my sort of time in DOF at the moment, I've sort of been uh, working uh, with colleagues around three contracts that have been in place for quite some time, separate contracts to this one. Um, we have very strong contract management teams in place overseeing each of those contracts, and they have been in place for some time, and they are being very well managed, certainly in my view, um, the, and the contractor uh, is, is performing and held to account. So I don't think this is, there is a systematic issue across DOF in terms of contract management. I think, and, and I'm not excusing anyway, but I think these are, I would hope to say, the two of our examples. Yeah. We're looking at two examples today, which are very stark reading for, for, for no, your department, Mr. Duffy. Um, Ms. Flynn. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, and I suppose just to, to follow on from, from some of the comments that was made around the, the issue of the seven-year contract, and I do accept that. So obviously yourself and some of your team are, you know what I mean, relatively new into, yeah. into the post, and, um, and you weren't around at the time of the VNA um, direct transformation project in the land web. Um, but maybe just with hindsight, with your experience of working in the department, um, and it sounds really good with you know, all the things that you've mentioned around the, um, the contract management system that you have in place, and you have yeah. the list of contracts and when it expires, and, and that all sounds great. Um, but I think what sort of took us all by surprise when we were discussing it last week was how it went unnoticed after a period of time of seven years with that, that contract with BT, how there was no oversight or planning or preparation, you know, when you were coming up to the end of yeah, that, that contract. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, in, in your opinion, um, you know, the fact that that was, that was obviously missed, and maybe it was because there was, you had mentioned, there's now one overall audit risk committee, if there was several, that, that might have been part of the problem. But just in, in your opinion, do you think that this was down to a wider um, skills deficit among the civil service, or, um, or could it have been down to just a general lack of focus on cost? Um, and again, just in your opinion, because I know that you weren't in the department at the time. I, uh, you know, I can't explain why, um, why it was referred to as a 10-year contract when it was a seven-year with, you know, with a break point and for that extension. I, um, I, I just, I do want to say, I do think the team that were working, you know, were working hard and were, you know, doing, you know, actually, as I think Paul has said, this contract was a victim, you know, victim of its own success in a way. Um, it ended up having more work going through it. I can only really talk, you know, I can talk about where we are now, um, but that's not to, uh, you know, either. I don't want to be. Um, undermining the people that have worked on this previously. Um, I do think they were working hard and, you know, for whatever reason, the action didn't get taken that needed to get taken to break that contract. And uh, that, that is... Sure, if I could just add to that, you know, I think one of the, the, the key lessons learned from this report is that, you know, we need to ensure we've got the right people with the right skills. Yeah. Um, looking after certain aspects of, of service delivery. So in this instance, we probably had a, a very small team who were trying to transform service and support departments in doing that, who were also trying to monitor the contract, who were also doing lots of other things. And I think you know, we have to recognise that you know, there was, the people were probably spread too thinly. And what we've done about that now is we have certainly separated out that team. So we have a team dedicated with contract management skills and support from our procurement specialists managing the contract, and then we have a separate team who are doing the transformational work and, and the exit of the current contract. So very clear lessons learned from this report that we need to resource those areas properly with the right skills. And that was previously all done with one yeah. small team. Okay. Thank you. Just one more. Oh, okay, yeah. Thank you. And just quickly, on the in relation to the land web, um, it, can you provide any reason as to why, obviously, there was that 10-year um, Lapse between the 2010 um, report and recommendations. Um, is there any specific or glaring reasons as to why those recommendations weren't weren't acted upon or implemented within that that space of the 10 years until the 2020 report? 
Ian, are you able to? Because I know you've got the details. Oh, yeah, do you want me to? Oh, yes. Um, I would say that the recommendations made in the 2010 PIC report um, of the eight seven were um, implemented. Um, one became unnecessary to implement because of the passage of time and the issue which had been raised by the PIC had been resolved before um, before it came time to actually implement any of the recommendations. Um, of the other seven, um, we uh, were able to implement all um, in full, I think, to the expectations of the Public Accounts Committee. Um, there was one which related to um, pursuing value for money mechanisms in the land web contract at the time the break um, clause negotiations were underway in 2011. And we did pursue those options and looked at them in some detail at that time. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to negotiate the inclusion of those mechanisms um, in a revised contract um, in a value for money way. So the department decided that, um, that it wasn't worth the cost that would be involved in retrofitting those mechanisms into the contract. Um, and we didn't pursue that whenever the contract well, extension was agreed. Okay. Mr. Hildage. Thanks, thanks, Chair, and I'll obviously <coughs> share the concerns of uh, the, pre the speakers to date uh, this afternoon. Uh, th there, there was positives to it, as you say, but with the information we have before us today, obviously the negatives nearly tend to outweigh the thoughts at the minute. And really mind it to compare the general civil service attitude to the away team in a football match who sit in to play for a draw, keep things steady, but the home team scores with five minutes to go and there's panic stations. There just seems to be a trait uh, of don't do anything un until we have to. And again, even yesterday, there was a department that came here that's very room asking for 30 million pounds to rectify some legislation that hadn't been updated since 1989 and apologise that that hadn't happened. So I'm talking in terms of the general civil service there. Just concerns on the overall overall management uh, of the situation then. As it, as it went along, who, who had the approval for the overspends and was it communicated to anybody uh, within the department? Because obviously in the likes of the land, land web, the whistleblower did come forward. Uh, but surely potential overspends of this nature would have been maybe discussed within the department. It, did it have to take a whistleblower to come forward to alert the uh, PAC to this situation? <coughs> was it being kept quiet, basically, or what? Um, I, I, I don't think it would. No, it wasn't. Nothing. It wasn't being kept quiet, and uh, these issues were always. And this is not just something that's happened since I've arrived. But these issues would have been discussed, you know, with um, with with internal audit in the room. Um, but I, I will let Ian uh, deal with that particular issue. Um, the, the issues that were um, referenced from the whistleblower in the um, audit officers update report, I think, had been well known since before 2010, whenever the Public Accounts Committee last looked at the, the land web contract. Um, indeed, um, there's been several um, exchanges of correspondence between the Northern Ireland Audit Office and Land and Property Services in relation to things like, for example, the level of fees over the past number of years. Um, so it, it didn't take a whistleblower to bring these issues to, to light. Um, all the information about the, um, the land web contract is actually published online on the NIGov website, or sorry, the gov.uk website. Um, there's a register of PFI contracts and there's full details of the contract on that. Um, and in addition, we've answered a number of queries from the office over the past number of years and media queries, in fact, about this project uh, and have been quite open about it. Um, information about the contract um, the fees, income, uh, and the surpluses that were being generated by the land registry were, were all um, openly disclosed in the department's accounts. So that there was no attempt to disguise any of these issues. They were all openly, openly um, declared. Uh, it was indicated at, at page 42 that no evidence that Landweb had delivered value for money in, in the report. How, how was this benchmarked? How, how, was, how did, was it deemed to maybe be value for money? Uh, were objectives achieved at that stage? How was it actually um, the original objectives of the, um, of the land web contract were, were largely to um, digitise the, the whole process, computerised process, and make it much more efficient and, and run much more um, smoothly so that the time taken to process applications would be substantially reduced and then the cost to um, customers would be reduced on the back of that too. 
Um, so there have been quite a number of benefits um, have come from the land web contract itself, and I think these were recognised in the 2008 um, Audit Office report and then uh, subsequently in this update report, in fact, that say that the original contract and the, um, the uh, value for money report undertaken in 2011 had shown that the contract did represent value for money. I think that the issue the Audit Office has um, picked up this time round, if, if I understand it correctly, is that whilst we have made efficiencies and savings um, in the land registry, we have not been able to pass those on to the end users of the service. And, uh, I think there has been an admission maybe that those dealing with it, I think Paul you had spoke about, maybe didn't have the, the skills potentially. Is there a lack of, of management skills or business acumen within the department? I think in terms of the management of the NI direct contract, that at the time um, the appropriate people weren't in the team with the required skills to manage the contract. I think the contract was being managed by, and it's no disrespect to my colleagues, but IT professionals, in a sense, who were very focused on supporting departments deliver transformation, and, and I suspect didn't have the right skills and uh, in terms of contract management and financial controls. And would you deem that lessons have been learned and that is much different position today? Well, as I can say, yes, yes, certainly we have, as I said, the Chair, we have we've put in place um, two separate teams. So we have a team there who are managing the contract, who are specialists in contract management, and also we have brought in somebody from our procurement division um, into that team as well to give some additional support. And then the teams who are, who are skilled and specialised in the IT aspects and then the transformation are leading on those parts of the, of, of the contract. So we very much separated out and shared those with the right skills are looking after the correct areas. I think that's a very key lesson learned from this from the, from this report. And I, I can assure you that in a number of other contracts that I'm familiar with within the department, those same procedures are now in place. And that there are certainly the three of the contracts that I'm working closely on at the moment each have a dedicated contract management team in place. Just at the PAC in 2010, the accountant officer said, uh, uh, with the benefit of hindsight, if we were doing it now, we would do it differently. Uh, we would certainly take into account the guidance that is around and incorporate these conditions in the contract positions. <laughs> How long did it take really to get that 2010 message through to the department? But lessons could have been learned much quicker. I think that was a comment in respect to Landweb at the time. Landweb, yeah. Um, well, I, I would um, say that what we're currently working on um, in land and property services is um, a complete transformation of all the services um, that we've got now, not just the land registration system, but also rate collection and property valuation. Um, and as part of that process, um, we are now using the um, uh, the uh, model contract for digital services um, from the Cabinet Office, um, and that includes a full range of value for money uh, mechanisms in the contract, including open book accounting and benchmarking, uh, and full access rights for our own internal audit and Northern Ireland Audit Office, and yearly um, reports from the supplier on their cost model and um, full disclosure of their costs, um, expenses, and their profit margins. So we definitely have learned those um, lessons and have applied them uh, in quite a rigorous way into the contracts that we are now taking forward and are letting over the next year or two. Okay, thanks, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and you're all very welcome. Well, I, I don't know where you jumped from the frying pan into the fire. Not the last time I was talking to you, you were in DVA and uh, a different <laughs> committee, but, but good luck in your new post. Um, just, uh, Chair, just to pick up on some of the points, I mean, just to end your set, in the um, in terms of the land web, the original contract started in 1989. What's yes. to stop it being a 25-year contract? I mean, it's, a, it's the run here to 2021. Is there any assurances that that will not continue, that will stop it at that? And, and that's, it, it is raised in price by 138% over the number, those number of years. Would that be correct? Up to 170. In, in cash terms, yes, the total amount of money that will be spent on the project by July 2021 um, will be, we expect, around £107 million. Pounds. Um, the original contract value when it was let in 1999, in 1999 prices, was £46 million. Pounds. 
Um, what's happened to cause the cost increase over that period of time is um, partly inflation. Um, the contract when it was originally left the core service was for the land registry service that was to be paid by transaction fees. So every transaction process through the system um, would uh, attract a charge that would be paid to BT. Um, that's currently sitting at around £60 million pounds, um, with the impact of inflation over the 21-year period. Um, if you discount those figures, you actually end up with around £45 million pounds being spent through the core of the contract. Um, where the rest of the increases come from are additional services that we have asked BT to provide and enhancements. Um, this subject was fairly rigorously discussed, I think, at the 2010 PAC, um, and the Department Secretary at the time admitted that the Department had made a number of errors in the scoping of the contract originally. Um, the principal one being that um, the registry of deeds had not been included in the scope of the project. Um, the explanation given at the time was that the um, introduction of compulsory first registration of property, whenever it transferred, would eventually make the registry of deeds redundant and therefore didn't need to be included in the scope of the project. But time has shown that that um, didn't happen um, in the way that was expected. So we had to then retrofit that service into the contract. Um, there's a very substantial cost. Um, a training suite was added in um, as well. Um, and there are a good number of other um, additions to the contract. Um, now, with, with the benefit of hindsight, um, and probably with a little bit more foresight at the time, those things could have been included in the original contract, and that has definitely added to the increase in the costs. Um, the biggest single item that has added to the cost is um, the casework assistance support that's provided, which is essentially a staff substitution measure. Um, what we do is we employ caseworker staff through the BT contract um, rather than recruit civil servants. It gives us more flexibility in the um, in the staffing situation in land registry. Um, that arrangement is periodically reviewed. I think the last two times it was reviewed were in 2017 and in late 2018, um, and on both occasions it was found to be a better value for money option than continuing, or, sorry, than stopping the caseworker assistance contract and then bringing in civil servants on a permanent basis. Um, and that's added about £25 million pounds to the cost of the land web contract, though it is a cost which we will have to have incurred in any event if we had recruited the civil servants to do the work instead. Um, so that explains how the contract has moved from that £46 million to the £107 um, here. First part of your question was about whether the contract would extend beyond July 2021. Um, it, it will extend beyond July 2021. Um, as I previously mentioned to Mr. Hilditch, um, we're engaged in a number of digital transformation projects and land and property services. Um, one of the lessons learned from previous um, digital um, transformation projects and from other activities like it, well, if you try to take too much on at one time, you, you run the risk of failure. Um, the department decided in the land and property services projects to prioritise the rate collection system for um, procurement first um, on the grounds that it would deliver the greatest monetary benefits for Northern Ireland. Um, and that contract will be let um, this December. Um, we're currently in the final um, evaluation process of, for the tenders. Um, so we expect to let that contract in, in December and then we'll be going to the market with the land web system um, in 2021. Now, the, this is a complex system. Um, we think it may take two years to complete the procurement process. That's around the time it took to, to complete the rate collection procurement. Um, and it will probably take two to three years to implement the new system. So the existing contract will have to be extended to maintain the land registry services whilst we are procuring and implementing the new system. Right, and just to follow on, to, sorry, just to follow on from that, uh, Sue, even to yourself and Ian in terms of, I mean, are we saying now, obviously, we have to ensure value for money. What we've learned from all of the audit reports, it's taken a period. And I know we're all coming later, and that's why it's just I, I see simple stats I know. and time frames. And, and the thing for me is, have we now got the skill set and the capacity to deliver value for money for this project? I believe we have. And um, I believe that, you know, in the department, we are, we are fortunate. We have got procurement professionals. We have got uh, professionals in both the teams who um, are all working very closely together, and I believe that we have got that. And that negotiation that will take place with, with suppliers, it, 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 you know, it is happening at a very uh, high level, along with we're using cabinet office expertise as well. So they have you know, the wider 
experience and expertise that they bring. Um, also, they, of course, are often negotiating uh, with suppliers as well, and that bringing that bigger, I suppose, those bigger bucks to bear, you know, is actually proving to be very helpful. And just finally, in terms of the recommendations in the audit reports, I mean, use many of those you're using the, the up-to-date ones, the recommendations. Are you taking those on board in terms of fee orders, in terms of future agreements and contracts, and before agreements expire, on all those things? Yeah. So you know, and I do think the contract management system that we now have, um, you know, is actually highlighting these issues much earlier than they ever would have been before. And you know, so we have got an opportunity much earlier to discuss and to actually get the best value. Um, I think work has been done on the fees order. Ian will be able to confirm that. Um, but you know, unfortunately, we weren't able to progress the fees order uh, previously uh, when the assembly wasn't. Chair, sure, if I could just also add that the recommendations in each of the reports are being um, monitored in terms of implementation by the department's. Audit and Risk Committee. Yeah. And actually, they're before the committee uh, this month to be reviewed, to ensure that they are being delivered on. Can I just, before I bring other members in, can I just a couple of observations and answers so far? I mean, would it be fair to say, you know, I think since these contracts were signed off first in 2010 and then 2012, I think there have been four accounting officers in that department. Mr. Hillage read a quote from the then accounting officer in 2010. Um, <clears throat> I, I mean, the audit office gives reports. The audit office obviously raised we have red flags and, and the, on these issues. What about your own internal auditors and, and, and audit teams in the department? What were they doing? So, uh, we have it's, it, we now have a group uh, in you know, a no, no, not now. What were they doing? Oh, then? sorry. Um. I assume they were part of the audit and risk committees. Yes, yeah, so there would have been a, 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 number, a range of topics that the internal audit team would have looked at um, and subjects throughout the year and provided reports to the accounting officer. Um, it's whether or not this particular issue was covered as part yeah. of their internal audits. I suppose, I suppose, Mr Duffy, what I'm asking is, was that done in 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15 and on? Well, there would have been an audit programme for each of those years. Um, and was it not picking these these gross overspending uh, figures up? Well, I, I, I'm assuming that, so. The audit plan would tend to look at a number of high risk areas across the department, um, and unless this had been flagged as a high risk area, it wouldn't have been within the audit programme. But I certainly know the, the internal yeah. audit did. Do. But when you say unless it's been unless it's been flagged, you can understand for us as public representatives that we don't understand un, unless it's been flagged. It, I mean. Uh, I've listened to you, your answers to questions. Both of you used the term that I think it was in reference to Northern Ireland Direct that it was a victim of its own success. But I hope its success. I hope its success was um, to the value of sixty million pounds, because that I'm not I'm not sure that provides value for money, because it's impossible probably to to, to quantify how much. That, vic that success is, is within that £60 million extra bracket. But, but, you know, these are two contracts that should have cost Northern Ireland PLC £96 million by the time they concluded. They will cost them, as we're being told today, £217 million. £121 million overspent on two contracts. And all that that could have delivered for Northern Ireland PLC. I don't believe that that provides value for money, and I don't believe that it can be used, the term "victim of its own success" can be used in that context. With all due respect, I think on NI Direct um, originally it was planned that there would be uh, a certain number of contracts delivered through that contract, and actually the number of contracts that are, that were delivered actually exceeded that. Um, the individual projects the, the, that went through that contract, they were the responsibility of the individual of, of departmental accounting officers, not the DOF accounting officer. They were the responsibility of departmental accounting officers to, um, to sign those off. And I think that when we talk about that term, we, we, we're referring to the fact 
that you know originally it was uh, was it 12 or 16 and in the end there were 40 uh, 40 contracts so it, it's not comparing like with like um, uh, you know and I suppose that's when we talk about that there, were, <coughs> there was you know and we've learned an awful lot I think when this was being developed initially digital services were uh, were quite new in a way mm. um, and you know that's but, but if, if we get to the point that it's 40 contracts, I think that reinforces the point that when the contracts were negotiated in 2010 and 2012, that those from the private sector effectively ran rings around civil servants on, the, on these issues and contracts they negotiated. Sure, if I could add, I think you know, one of the failings in this contract at the outset was that there was an underestimation of the extent of digital transformation that was ready to take place. Um, this contract, at, when it was let for, for £50 million, pounds, the intention was around £20 million pounds of that would provide for a modernised contact centre, um, which would support NI Direct, and there was around £30 million was there for departments then to draw upon to, well not draw upon, but to use that con the remaining part of that contract value to deliver and transform services. That element um, departments had much more to, to, to that they wished to deliver, um, so there, and that, I suppose that was one of the reasons why the contract then value was exceeded. Each of those projects that went through that contract would have went through a rigorous business case process, an assessment of affordability, assessment of value for money, all within each individual department to ensure that, that that spend of public money was going to deliver um, a, a benefit. It's hard, to, it's hard to see how you, a business case could be that rigorous when we're looking at these figures. But this is the figures around the value of a contract. The business case would have been for the projects that were put through that. So the spend on this contract didn't come out of, in a sense, the DOF budget. It came out of individual departmental budgets. So they would have went through that. But it all, came out, the, it all came out of the public purse paid for by the taxpayer in Northern Ireland. That's the point. And I completely accept that. All I'm saying is that process would confirm that those projects were delivering value for money, and for the and for the taxpayer, what was delivered was a wide range of transformational services. You know, I can speak from my <coughs> experience within DVA of a number of the services that were put online as a consequence of accessing the contract. Well, before I bring Mr. Muir, let me just say to you: Can you can you sit sit in front of this committee and say that they overspend 121 million pounds? Provided, provided the, the the extra services you're talking about in contracts, that that provided value for money, that extra 121 million. Sure, and just to be clear, I'm in no way defending the overspend in the contract value. That it was unacceptable, and the measures and controls shouldn't be in place to prevent that from happening. I'm, what I'm trying to articulate just is there were a number of very key public services that were delivered and would have been assessed in terms of value for money through the contract. Mr. Muir. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, there was obviously gateway reviews and other different reviews that occurred through the lifetime of both of these projects, um, and they would have came back with findings and recommendations. Why weren't they acted upon, and why were, were these <coughs> fed up to the Permanent Secretary? Um, because they, these are established project management methodologies to ensure that we are not in the situation we are here today. Uh, what I can talk about is how it works. And uh, a new process that we have put in place. So, gateway reviews, um, I think they would have come to the Permanent Secretary if they were red gateways. Um, actually, now all gateway reviews come to the Permanent Secretary. Um, and that seems to be the right thing. Also, alarm bells ring if you know a gateway review is uh, to be conducted and perhaps the team say they're not ready for the gateway review quite yet um, that is also now uh, a matter that gets flagged and actually you know, the gateway review will happen when the gateway review is is to be done so we put those arrangements in place i uh, i can't i'm afraid i can't comment on uh, what happened whether Paul and Ian will be able to, who've been here, who've been here longer than me. <laughs> um, just, I, I know there was a gateway in 2016 on the NI Direct contract. It had a, an amber rating uh, with a number of recommendations which were 
then taken forward um, and implemented. I think the key, there were a number of issues around, um, lined up around the lack of innovation from BT as part of that, and gateway view. And I, th I think the most telling recommendation that came out of it was that the gateway had, had stated that they felt that the contract had outlived its useful life, and actually a new contract should be put in place. And I think, to me, that was they they witnessed them the volume of projects going through that contract were much greater than what was anticipated, and therefore that contract should have been brought to a close and a new one procured. So that, and I suppose that's what we've got to now in terms of in 2018, that procurement process is underway in terms of preparations for it, in terms of looking to procure a new contract by 2022. So I think another very key lesson learned from this report is looking ahead and planning ahead for, for procurements and contracts coming to an end. So that those steps are already in place in terms of when this contract now ends in 2022. I think you have outlined quite a lot about what's being done now to ensure there's no repeat of what's happened in the past. And it's very clear what happened in the past was unacceptable. Uh, usually the lead department in terms of project management and issuing guidance to other departments and NDBPs and all the rest of it. How are you ensuring that this filters down to other departments and other ALBs and all the rest of it to yeah. ensure that this doesn't occur in another department? So um, it's absolutely right. So you know we have been. I suppose one of the things we've been doing is we've been uh, spending a lot more time making sure our staff have the right skills to to manage these contracts, and we uh, the cabinet office are running um, c commercial assessment centres for us and the NICS board has recently agreed that they will be rolled out across other government departments so we piloted them in our own department first put our staff through them um, and they are now being rolled out across other departments the gateway review issue now applies for all de you know, all departments so we are as we develop things we are pushing out those lessons uh, other departments some departments may be doing you know may have already been doing it but we're actually making sure we've formalized it and that, I think, is, is, is a key difference. Same with our contract management uh, system that we've developed. Uh, you know, that, will be, that is being rolled out, I think, Paul, into other departments. I think that is happening. Yes, so yeah, that, that sort of contract tra management tracking system is being, uh, has just been piloted within DOF and will now be rolled out um, to other departments. Some of the other controls that have been put in place or strength, strength of those controls around project management is a new guidance has been issued to all departments around project management. And one of the key aspects of that is an SRO, a formal SRO appointment letter. So anyone who's going to be responsible for leading a major project like this will now be formally appointed to that position. Uh, that will clearly set out what their role and responsibilities are and what they'll be held accountable for. It also states in that letter that if there is a PAC hearing in respect of that particular project, then that SRO will be expected to be accountable to the PAC for the performance. So it's very clearly, it's clarifying roles and responsibilities, which I think is an, another very important lesson learned from this report mm -hmm. about clarifying roles and responsibilities for those involved in projects. Um, and the department has also has now put in place a formal uh, project management profession looking at the skills and capabilities across the civil service and delivering projects, ensuring they make use of um, some of the uh, training opportunities that are available through the Cabinet Office. They have a number of um, project management leadership um, uh, courses that, that, that staff are now being encouraged to, to attend. Yeah. So if you're leading a project of a certain quantum or sorry, a certain value, then you must have been through that formal training process before you're giving that role. So I suppose it's... it's it's not putting someone who doesn't have the necessary skills or is a generalist into a role where you require uh, certain skills. Yeah. That was my next question. I think it's an important issue. How many SROs was there for each of the projects over the history of them? <laughs> I actually won't be able to answer that. We can come back with that information. Yeah. I, think it would I, I suspect there, there was, was it potentially one for the NI Direct contract. There's one. No, I, I would have to double check that, but my would be my understanding there only be, there's been one, but I I, I would clarify that. Yeah, one of the risks is if there's multiple SROs, but if there's one, there's clear responsibilities around that. And the last one is that the total contract costs are forecast not to exceed 110 million by 2022. 
a covenant are used that that will be the case and I won't see that in mind. I think, as Paul has outlined earlier, we actually do have up-to-date um, costs of, the, of this project, and I think we are confident that that will be the case. Um, I think the figure, the figure before the 110 was around 70. Um, so, you know, in getting to that 110, we uh, did quite a lot of work to make sure that the, this would be the once and for all figure. Um, when we did this in, uh, in 2019. Well, in 20... I think it was 2018, um, 2017 2018, you know, the decision was taken that no other projects would be uh, facilitated through this contract. So there is no new development happening. Um, there has been some very recent minor development in terms of responding to the COVID-19 situation, which this contract has facilitated a number of things in, uh, in, in terms of responding to that particular issue. But there is no new development going through the contract. The spend between now and, and 2022 is in respect of ensuring the contact centre continues to be delivered to support public services and also all those um, transformed services that have been developed through the contract need to be maintained so they are being maintained uh, so citizens can access those up until the end of 20, 2022 uh, and that's what brings the cost really up to 110. Thank you. Okay, Mr Beggs. <coughs> Frankly, shocking how public money has, has, has been used in this area. Um, the major project, the strategic uh, partnership project, would you accept there's been little strategic thinking in the choice of the areas that have been investigated or improved? In terms of prioritising the projects, yeah. so I think in 2012, um, when this contract was signed, um, there was a piece of work undertaken to look at the potential for digital services across the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Uh, I think there was around 100 so departments were asked to identify what public service they, they were in a position to um, digitalise um, for citizens. And I think around about 120 potential services were brought forward as part of that process. Um, they were then prioritised down to 18 at that time. Um, and the main driver for prioritisation was the volume of transactions that was going that that, that service would, would provide. So it should that have been the right criteria? Surely it's 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 about cost effectiveness. It's about the difference it makes to citizens' lives, not just a number. Well, it wasn't purely just that. So uh, I think the criteria was around the number of transactions, and those that that level was anything with transactions over ten thousand, and also those that would deliver savings or have a, the greatest impact on citizens. I think the other thing to bear in mind, around that time, departments had to be ready to actually move to use the contract. So some departments may not have been in a position to digitalise their particular services or may not have funding available to do so. One of the areas that you know, it's £1.4 million pound was spent in developing a system to buy a fishing licence. I had a quick look online. You have to put in which licence you want your details, date of birth, uh, and then pay for it. Did you consider using that on Amazon instead of uh, spending £1.4 million? I mean, it's a very, very basic purchase. Is that good use of public money? But the decision around whether that was good value for money would have been determined by the Department of Agriculture. Well, I'm assuming the Department of Agriculture was doing fishing licence. But who's responsible for such choices? Who's accountable for it? Well, the, there, isn't, there isn't a single person or, or, or who can decide what each individual department prioritises. So it was for departments to come forward. So that particular, the fishing licence, is I accept it doesn't sound like a particularly exciting or novel um, service to be transforming early on in, in this process. It does issue around 40, 40, 44,500 licences a year and brings an income of about 0.5 million pounds. So it does impact on quite a number of citizens. But at that time, that was probably a project that was ready to go live, or was ready to be developed, where in lots of other areas, they may not just been as advanced at that stage. Bearing in mind, this was 2012, mm -hmm. and a lot of departments were only starting their digital journey. Can I turn to the landlord registration scheme, 1.2, 1.3 million? Again, there's not a huge deal of interaction with the person using that service. It's, you know, basic details are getting recorded. Is that good value for money? I'd have to 
bowed again on this one in terms of help, if that's an LPS service. Um, um, you know, it's DFC, uh, Department for Communities Service. Um, hello, um, I used to be the Director of Housing, so maybe I ought to um, try and answer it for you, Mr. Beggs. Um, the landlord registration system um, was an attempt for the first time to get a, a list of all the um, residential landlords in Northern Ireland to allow regulation of, of landlords. Um, so it, it's not simply producing a list. Um, it also has all kinds of functionality around contacting landlords um, and, and following up issues with them as well. Would you accept that there are many other areas that could benefit citizens and there are much more interactions such as has happened in other places? Uh, with the digitization of application for repeat prescriptions, something which there's millions of, of applications could have benefit rather than thousands. Do you accept that there are other areas such as health justice and particularly local government which is a much greater impact on citizens' lives, which could have uh, benefited everyone much more and could have brought in much more savings? Uh, Mr. Riggs, I, I suppose in terms of digital transformation, you know, this particular contract was not the only contract at that time that was being used. So the Department of Health would have had its own transformation programme being delivered through their business services organisation, working closely with the health and uh, the health boards, uh, the health board, and, and the individual trusts. So, e-prescriptions was developed through their contracts and their transformation. I think also if you look at the when you look into the health sector and you look at the the, the scope and the and the value of their transformation projects, you know, if you look at something like the Encompass project recently announced, it was two hundred and seventy-five million pounds. Those transformation projects within the health tend to be of a quite a significant value, but they have mechanisms in place to transform the services within their sector. Well, is there a need for joined up thinking? I was interested to, to hear you at the start, you talked about the Northern Ireland Identity Assurance that you're looking at. Equally, that can apply to health as it can apply to every other aspect of government. Would that not have been an obvious starting point for a strategic digitisation programme? And, and you know, I completely accept your point. There is more that needs to be done in terms of collaboratively working across sectors. So, we have established a, a digital transformation steering group, which has representatives from central government, local government, the health and education sector, and that's about looking at how we can bring together um, transformation journeys for citizens. So, cutting across boundaries. And um, through this NI Direct contract, there are a number of of common tools, it's, it, they term it a, a toolkit, so um, ability for you to go online and pay for things. So the, the, the piece of um, software allows you to do that is available to all public sector bodies and has been used by other public sector bodies, so they don't have to pay a developer to develop that for their unique system. So there is sharing of some of that work. Just in terms of um, proof of identity, which is a requirement for some of the things that happen online, Everyone in Northern Ireland who um, uh, pays tax can, uh, if necessary, log on and register f through the inland or the HMRC and go through their system. So are we going to invent another system and pay for another system to verify? Or are we just going to plug into an existing uh, design that's already there? I think the challenge is if you are a citizen so if you were a GB citizen wanting to renew your, you, uh, apply for a driving licence, the DVLA, you would have to ver verify yourself through a different system than what um, HMRC are using. So there's not even a single system across GB. And I think that is a flaw. That, you know, what, ideally what we want is a single identity assurance system across um, many countries for, for, for the citizen. Um, but you know, that, is, that is a challenge at the moment. Um, I'll, I'll turn to, now to the specific issue of uh, continuing to issue extensions to existing contracts. And, and when you go to uh, seek an extension, you accept unless you have uh, the time and a detailed plan of a replacement uh, in place, you have no negotiating power and you're going to be taking the cleaners by the contractor who you're talking to. I think if, if you find yourself in that position, then you certainly have weakened your hand in terms of negotiating. I, I can't say that we have 
in the arrangements that have recently been in place in terms of having a new commercial uh, director. We have been working with some of our strategic suppliers, drawing in the Crown Commercial Services in the Cabinet Office, so leveraging the UK position on some of these suppliers. So um, we're, it certainly weakens your position and is not where you would want to find yourself. Well, the strategic partner project has been extended three years. Can you give an assurance that there is adequate time to put in a new contract going forward? I can give you assurance that work is underway and, and plans are underway to put in place a new contract by October 22. Okay. Turning now to Landweb, which was um, uh, uh, originally due to finish in 2016, the, the breakpoint was, was missed and then extended to 2019. Uh, there's then been a, another, a second extension to 2021. Um, now, bearing in mind when Landweb was established, much of the cost would have been up front. The design of the system, the equipment, the training of all the staff, so that there's a large front load at fixed cost and the rest of it will be the profit coming in thereafter. We've been giving profit to BT in that case every time we extend. So my question is, will we, we, well, can you assure me we will have it replaced by the two, 2021 or is there going to be another extension uh, uh, which is going to cost taxpayers more money than it should? I'll defer that one to Ian from the LPS. Cause... Well, the, the contract um, will be extended from 2021 onwards. Um, it was um, Mr. Boylan's question uh, on this, um, where I pointed out that um, and we have a number of these projects in LPS, uh, and a decision was taken back in 2016 that the procurement of the new rate collection system um, would take precedence um, since it delivered the greatest monetary benefits for, for Northern Ireland. Um, the consequence of that is that the procurement of the land web system has to follow on from the, um, the procurement of the rate collection system. Um, so we will have to extend the current land web contract in 2021 in order to ensure the continuity of the service whilst we're procuring and building the replacement system for land registration. Um, the contract extension that was negotiated in 2018 and has carried forward from 2019 to 2021 secured a 30% reduction in the transaction fees payable to BT. Um, we're currently in the middle of the negotiations with BT on the um, further extension uh, and we're, we're looking for further um, uh, further reductions and discounts on the transaction charges that was secured plus a number of other um, benefits and enhancements um, in the contract as it's moving forward. One of the earlier um, recommendations, uh, I think it was around 15, 16, was that there should be open book accounting. Do you accept that the failure to have open book accounting inserted in 2016 weakens your hand for your negotiations in 2018 and again weakens your hand going forward in this next round? So why have we not got open book accounting built in to such lucrative contracts? Um, it, it wasn't built into the contract when it was signed initially in 1999. Um, I think the permanent secretary, um, who was at the PAC in 2010, accepted that that was an error. Um, and looking back, we should have done that differently. Um, now, the position that we had uh, when we came to negotiate the, um, the break option um, in 2014 was that it would have involved um, a fundamental change to the contract with BT. Um, they declined to offer that at no cost to the department. Um, the, the cost was um, presented as around £50,000 per year. Um, and whenever we took a look at that and considered that option, um, we considered that didn't represent value for money over the lifetime of the extension. Do, do, you, um, do you accept that in 2016 when you negotiated that? You have no idea whether that represents value for money to the taxpayer or not? Um, do, do you mean the extension you negotiated in 2016? then to put a replacement system in? You um, as I explained, uh, when we had taken a decision in the department that the rate collection system was the priority um, and the land registration therefore would have to be deferred. Um, so yes, we could have, um, and we had started work in 2015 on the, um, on the replacement for all of these systems, but um, with, uh, with the other um, digital transformation projects we want to deliver in LPS at that time, a decision had to be taken on how we prioritise the efforts rather than try to take on too much 
at the same time. Do, uh, your core question is how to accounting, could we have got a better deal in 2018 whenever we negotiated the two-year extension? Um, I having a look at what is uh, on the table at present, um, I think we would probably have had to secure um, a reduction of around 40% in 2018 when we negotiated the 30% reduction. And that's nothing approaching that is currently on the table for discussion. Um, the upshot of all of that is I think that we um, would not have got a substantially better deal in 2018 than we were able to secure um, at that time. Uh, and in addition to that, we also secured in 2016 um, a contribution from BT of £100,000 per year um, to an innovation fund, which is specifically for enhancements to the um, non-web system, um, as a result of which um, we have spent very little on change requests um, on the system since 2016. But do you accept you have no idea if uh, excessive profit is still being made by BT under these contracts? Um, I think that the contract is probably now profitable. Um, I don't know if you recall, Mr. Beggs, but in, in 2010, Craig Apsley from BT said he suspected BT would never see profit from Landweb. I don't think I agree with that um, assessment, um, though I wouldn't su suggest that it's super profits. Um, previously, I mentioned the impact of inflation on the cost of the contract. Um, in 1999 prices, what has been paid to them under the core contract, um, which is the continuation of the fees, um, that you alluded to at the start of the question. Um, if we um, rebase all of our payments to date um, in 1999 prices, the, the current total runs at just short of 45 million compared to an estimated 46 from the contract was signed. So um, I am sure that BT has made a profit from the land web system. Uh, I don't think that they have made an excessive or a super profit from it. As we don't have the figures, we don't know. Final question to uh, Permanent Secretary. Um, would you accept that if there had been open book accounting, uh, there would be greater transparency in the next level of bidding for a new project, and the replacement may even be cheaper than you may have to pay because people, the rest of the customers, do not know what the cost uh, has been at present? Uh, and can you assure me that going forward there will be open book accounting so that... Uh, uh, you don't have to try and negotiate it for it, but it's built in from the start. So, um, you know, we, do, we, we do look at a lot of what we're doing in contracts and our you know, schemes. We do look at open book accounting. Uh, you know, that is something that we are looking at. And I think on this contract, we've got a member of the Cabinet Office Complex Transactions team on the, um, on the negotiations, as well as our own commercial director. And I will definitely be, uh, you know, be stress testing that and actually, you know, getting their advice as to whether that is the right thing to do. Um, if, you know, if it is the right thing to do, we will do it. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. McHugh. Chair, I was just going to add in terms of the, uh, the NI Direct contract that um, there was an issue about um, the department not having the, the accounts from BT, yeah. and, and that situation has been rectified. We now have all the accounts from BT dating back to, to the life of this contract. So they have been received over the last uh, year or so. Are they being made available to the audit office to uh, help with our uh, uh, report? Um, I, I don't think they've been provided to the audit office. Can they be? But I, 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 I would have to check about it, I'm sure they're, they're, they're published okay, accounts. It's public money paying for them, so there's no reason why they shouldn't be. Yeah, so right. and I assume they're published accounts. And how many years are we talking about? I don't know offhand, but we've got... Um, I, I suspect we have them for so in the last three or four years we would have their accounts. So possibly since 2017 when this revision took place? Yeah. yeah. But not before? I couldn't say. I just know that we now are in receipt of the accounts that we had requested okay. in the past. Well, perhaps if you could provide them to the other office, that would be useful, Mr. Duffy. Just a small point for me on, okay. on the accounts. Would you accept that companies sometimes can manipulate final accounts? So unless you have the full detail, you don't know if excessive costs are being built in by some of their own uh, organisation for associated costs. So you may not know the real facts simply by the, the, the uh, final accounts unless you have the real detail. Is that Would you accept that? I would imagine the accounts are prepared according to the necessary accounting and standards, but I suspect it would be very hard to drill into them to, to identify the information. And I know you're not suggesting Mr. in the case of BT that that would be the case, Mr. Bex. Mr. Hugh McHugh. Good. A five-year-old leg, you're all very welcome. Um, again, uh, much of the ground has been covered 
Uh, and I'm inclined to uh, agree entirely with uh, Mr. Beggs when he talks about open book accounting. And I reflect on when they were building windmills in West Tyrone, and uh, companies were meeting us as councillors in our local councils. And for each, I think it was the megawatt that was being produced, they were offering a thousand pounds when we knew, in fact, that uh, it should have been somewhere more in the region of five thousand to six thousand to community associations. And uh, the excuse that they used for that was that, uh, well, whenever we do the books, uh, we can't offer any more. And we said, well, we can count too. Give us the books, let us have a look at them, and we'll soon see whether or not that's right. Uh, and I can't help but feel there was a certain degree of, uh, of this with uh, BT uh, and the whole LPS project and that as well. Uh, we already talked about the inefficiencies uh, or the inability uh, or the lack of expertise in terms of negotiating a contract in the first instance. But without doubt, at the end of the day, if, um, if the civil service didn't have that expertise, then BT did have the expertise. So they would have known exactly what it was that they were doing. And whenever they were being overpaid for a service, they knew that exactly. So in one respect, I, I think they're culpable as well too. Um, I also uh, can't help but feel that it was a wee bit like a cash cow for the land and property services. Uh, that uh, when it was meant to be, I think, cost recovery in, uh, in terms of the customer. Uh, and yet now we now know that they were being overcharged mostly for the service. And if I just offered us an explanation or an excuse that the money that went into that particular department has been reutilised, we'll say, in terms of the general public, that doesn't get away from the fact that those who had effectively used the service, that they were being unfairly taxed. And that was exactly what it actually was. It was like an indirect tax in itself, and that those people were being overcharged. So I'd like to think that, uh, in moving on from here, that we do have a much more robust, robust system in every respect in terms of adding uh, and uh, in terms of arriving at a fair figure, uh, a fair cost, to say, to the customer for the use of services and so on. And I'd like to know just what do we have in place in order to deal with that. Um, the other point that, uh, that, that jumped out at me too, just when I was read through the reports and that on it, was that, um, and again, it's come back to the same points that Mr. Beggs had made about the open book accounting, that uh, BT were able to give a, like, what would you call it, a rebate of 1.8 million in 2019 uh, without the open book accounting, uh, and um, that that would imply in itself that they know uh, uh, how much it is that they can afford and we'd like to see what or not it is that they could actually, if anything, make a greater contribution than that. Uh, when we do talk about value for money, uh, it's not just value for money for, we'll say, the civil service in general in terms of taxpayers' money or, or even to BT, but in particular to the people who make use of the service, uh, that they should be guaranteed that they're going to receive value for money as well. As I said, these were merely sort of uh, observations not that I had. One final point, the strategic partner project and consultants who had actually looked at that as well too, they were sort of concluding that uh, that, uh, that they had done okay, whereas in fact that didn't seem to be the case, uh, that I thought too that again there was, seems to be a deficiency there, or they had fallen down on what it was that they were expected to deliver. So I asked myself, who is it that sort of audits the consultants? Uh, is it that whenever they come along to look at these things, is this a a tick box and exercise for them, and that will once again they receive probably uh, large amounts of taxpayers' money. Uh, yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Just this general comment. Okay. Um, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Permanent Secretary, and, and Paul for coming in. A, a few general questions. First of all. Um, we have spoken about at the beginning the new relationship with the Crown Commercial Service. Um, does the Northern Ireland Civil Service have a strategic supplier framework? We've, we've actually started to put one in place, started to uh, create a strategic supplier relationship, so we're just starting on that journey, uh, working very closely with, uh, with the government.
And will there be Crown? Re well, they may not be called Crown representatives no, here, but will there be Crown representatives? Be, it, we, will, we will be looking to have the equivalent, um, uh, and you know, with with support coming from those pe from the from the equivalent in the cabinet office, who obviously bigger that bigger oversight of those started on that. So, just for illustration, yeah. I had a conversation with one of our strategic players last week, um, and, and as part of that conversation, yeah. one of the Crown services um, representatives was on that call and supporting uh, us in terms of engaging with that supplier. So the, um, the, whenever um, Carillion collapsed, uh, there was a huge look in the Cabinet Office at how they manage procurement, how they manage these big partnerships. Mm -hmm. And they produced a new MOU and there was a, um, I should declare chair for a period, I was, um, when I was working in the private sector after I left the civil service, I was advising one of these strategic suppliers as part of how I knew some, something about it, obviously don't anymore. Um, what, did anything, did a similar exercise happen in Northern Ireland? Do we know, as in was there a, was there a look at, a structural look at how we manage strategic suppliers at that time? I don't know about that time. Um, I, I, what I know is what we're doing now. Um, yeah. We're very much um, building on what the cabinet office have done. And actually, you know, in a recent uh, contract, you know, we brought in the uh, Crown Commercial representative, and actually, it was great because they were able to put the put our issue on the agenda when mm. you know when the chief executive um, of the cabinet office was talking to that supplier. Our issue was on that agenda, and uh, that was really. And did that relationship, sort of, for most of the, the period of this contract, like up until the last couple of years, did that, in a sense, outsourcing of outsourcing expertise from Belfast to London, did that just not happen? Was there just was the approach just that procurement was happened from DOF here or DFP as it was, and it was just we did our best basically. I think, you know, in terms of once, once the contract was let, then it was managed within that particular business area. Mm -hmm. um, and the approach has been taken now. Uh, as Sue said, you know, we've appointed a commercial director who now has sight of all our strategic contracts and, and engages with all our strategic suppliers. So individual business areas, if they're having a conversation with a strategic supplier, must have our commercial director sitting with them. So that individual now can see the full picture of where that person is. is that, and that's all departments must have the DOF commercial director with them? Not at the moment. So at the moment, that is, that is being ruled out within DOF with a yeah. view to, 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 to rule it out further. Right, okay. So it's, it's, at the minute it's DOF, but if someone's from DERA or a, a, another department, they don't, but is that going to be guidance that goes out from DOF? That will be the plan. You know, yeah. they will adopt something similar to, to what we're doing. And, and just look, looking, not to make everything about RHI, but... Um, to go back to the first, um, the initial example, um, one of the some of the initial uh, pages of the RHI report. In fact, the, the, the one of the first recommendations um, uh, is that the devolved administration should essentially look at whether it has the skills and resources to deliver the policy safely and competently. Clearly, this is less about policy. This is not, we're not talking about policy delivery. We're talking about contract letting and management. Yeah. But there are similarities, and indeed, I've lost my place now. But um, Mr. Donnelly, who's sitting a few feet from me, is quoted in the uh, is quoted in the very first few pages of the actual report. If I can find it, he can probably quote verbatim for me if I defer to. Uh, uh, Mr. Donnelly's concerns included that. Uh, it feels strange to be quoting when you're a few feet away, Ken, but you have enough airtime here, so I, I'll, I'll I'll quote you verbatim. The scheme is at serious systemic weaknesses from the start. In fact, the department decided not to mirror the spending controls in Great Britain has led to very serious ongoing impact in the Northern Ireland budget, etc., etc. Um, though that was about policy delivery, it sounds eerily similar to what you're saying in terms of contract letting, yeah. both in relation to land, web, and generally, that there's a there was a structural naivete about the way both commercial contracts and also policy. Would you, are there similarities, or is that too facile? All I, all I can talk about really is what we're doing now. Which is that we um, we are putting our, our our teams, you know, when they're responsible for these contracts, through uh, through training, through you know, through commercial skills um, and project management, and we have got the cabinet very much supporting us on that. Um, I don't know whether Paul can say something about 
you know, not, not because Paul was involved in this project either, but just because of his wider mm -hmm. experience here? Well, certainly there is a clear recognition that there are skills shortages in particular areas yeah. and, and not necessarily the right people in the, in the right posts at the right time. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as I you know, said to Mr. Muir about, you know, the project management profession is one area where we have focused on in terms of ensuring we get the right people with the project management skills mm -hmm. if they're leading projects. The same can be said about contract management. And, and in terms of digital skills, we've recently just uh, commissioned or just received draft research report looking at digital capability across not just the civil service but the public sector to identify skills gaps there. Um, within DOF, we do have an ICT profession where we try to create careers, a career pathway. So we uh, and develop those skills internally for those who are going to be leading those and uh, working in those particular types of areas as well. So there are um, the improvements you're making. There is a thread between the improvements you're making, hoping to make in relation to contract management and also policy delivery. Yeah. There's a there's a thread between the response to RHI and the response to some of what we're talking about today. Very much so. Okay. Yeah. I um, think you know, one of the things we've recognised is you do need multidiscipline teams. Um, and, and ensuring that you have, the right, you, you have that variety of skills um, involved in whatever is being taken forward at that time, that service or function. Do you think, one final question, Chair, do you think there is a similar, in terms of um, wanting to do things, um, when I want to say constitutionally, I don't mean constitutionally the way we always talk about it in Northern Ireland, I mean constitutionally as an organisationally separate, is there a desire to do things in a distinct way here um, as opposed to, you know, as in distinct from Whitehall? Were there similarities there in terms of the way it sounds like commercial expertise was done in a very distinct way here, even when it was clear that there was not the, um, as it were, indigenous commercial expertise to do it, and similarly with policy delivery? Does that make? Uh, yeah, that is fair. Yeah, what we're doing now is, I think, reaching out. Uh, I've been doing for a little while. Okay, thank you. Um, can, can, I, can I just ask, um, Mr. Snowden, can I just ask you a question in terms of um, LPS? Um, I think there's a, my understanding is that there has been, for several years now, significant land registration fee surpluses. Um, this is, in fact, an indirect tax. What, what uh, is being done um, to address that issue? The um, fees charged by land register are certain um, regulations um, which have to be passed by the Assembly by the affirmative procedure. Um, so whenever the Assembly wasn't sitting um, between 2017 and the start of this year, we weren't actually able to make any changes to the fees. So that's why the surpluses were generated. Um, um, as we drove down the costs of the land registry and increased the efficiency of the operation, uh, and simultaneously, the number of applications that we received increased. Um, then, what we ended up with was uh, a surplus. Um, now, um, because of the COVID impacts on the economy and therefore on the property market, the amount of work that's going through the land registry has dropped very significantly this year. Um, so, it is um, likely that we're going to, at best, break even, I think, um, in terms of income and costs in the land registry in the current financial year. Um, the difficulty with setting a, a new fees order looking forward is try to work out what's going to happen over the next two or three years um, so that we can set an appropriate level of fees which will cover the registry's costs without generating any kind of um, excessive surplus. Um, that's um, a difficult thing to do at the best times, but in the current circumstances, it's, it's incredibly difficult. So what we have done is um, engage the University of Ulster's Economic Policy Centre to um, give us some analysis of, of what the likely scenarios are for the economy in Northern Ireland over the next two to three years and what kind of um, impact that might have on the local property market to allow us to make some kind of assessment of the volume of business that we're likely to see coming through the registry and therefore can set the fees appropriately. Okay. And the process... Okay. Will, sorry. sorry, when would, when would that piece of work um, that you're working with the academic zone be coming back mm -hmm. to the assembly then for discussion around that issue, because I accept, uh, we all accept, uh, in terms of the public purse, the money that's having to be expended uh, by the government in terms of the fight against COVID and announcements that have been made today. I fully appreciate that, but that equally can be applied to individual households as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the, uh, the Advice from the Economic Policy Centre from the University of Ulster we expect to get at the end of October. Um, they, they were actually waiting to see what the impact of the end of the furlough scheme was going to be, amongst a number of other things. And the Chancellor's National Diet obviously is going to feed into that whole process. Um, after that, um, we have to get the revised fees agreed by um, um, the Land Registry Rules Committee, which is made up of representatives of the Law Society and the Bar Council. Um, and then it's brought to the normal process in the Assembly. Um, our original target was to try to get that done in the early part of 2021, though with the need to get the additional analysis about the impact on the property market, it may take a little bit longer, but we certainly hope to have a revised fees order passed through the Assembly in the first half of next year. Would you agree with the assertion that um, LPS customers pay too much for the services they're provided? Um, in the, um, in the report of the, the audit office from June of this year, um, what I said was that the, um, the surplus has indicated that the fees were higher than they needed to be. And as a consequence of that, then um, users were being overcharged. Um, I would say that no user has been overcharged in the sense that they've all been paid, or all been charged the fees which are set in the legislation. Um, however, uh, in normal times, we would have been able to revise the fees downwards. Um, unfortunately, that option wasn't available to us throughout um, the, the past three years. Um, so yes, people have paid slightly more than they would have been expected to um, in normal circumstances. Having said that, the real terms cost of putting a transaction through the land registry now is substantially less than it was before the land web system was put in place. Um, in the year 2000, um, the cost of transacting the average house sale in Northern Ireland was £300. Um, it's now £220. Um, so that's um, substantial cash reduction by comparison to 2000, but it's also um, now only 43% in real terms what the cost was then. Um, and our transaction charges are, um, in, on average, slightly less than England um, and Scotland. Um, at the lower end, they're slightly more expensive, and at the top end, they're, they're a lot cheaper. Um, so there's no sense that people are being charged more than they ought to be for the for the service, because we're charging people what the legislation says we have to charge them. Um, but we did have an opportunity, or did, didn't have an opportunity to reduce the fees um, because of the absence of the Assembly. So is that a, is that a, a Whitehall way of saying no? <laughs> Um, um, no, people haven't been. I don't think people have been overcharged um, okay. in, in that sense. But I think that um, we could have reduced the fees over a couple of years. Okay, well, um, the, but we, can, can, we can, I, can I maybe ask you whenever you get your? Would you be good enough to share with this committee when you get your piece of work from the university uh, 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 with us, if you wouldn't mind? Yes, and, sir. Can I just say um, before we bring this session to a close, just a couple of points I would like to make in terms of. Uh, I think when you, some members talked about RHI, and I think if you go back to a report that the Audit Office did in November 2000 on PFI, and then we look at RHI, I think for some of us as public representatives, we, we are very eager to hear that the department, that government, that Northern Ireland PLC learns from these, these issues. Um, I, I did listen to, uh, you, to, to you, Ms. Green. You were saying that you're going to look at open book accounting. Uh, your, one of your predecessors ten years ago was going to do the same thing. I, th I think what I was saying. I mean, I think we we do look at open book accounting now, but I think in relation to uh, land web, as we you know as we go into this next negotiation, we will definitely be looking at that. Yeah, but as I say, one of your I think Mr. Hillage quoted it ten years ago. Um, that, that same assertion was being made pretty much and there have been and you are I think the third person since that person made that statement uh, to, to our predecessor committee um, and I think that that's something which needs to be looked at very clearly because um, we, we've heard from you today and from your colleagues um, in terms of providing some reassurance to this committee and the practices and procedures are in place to deal with these issues I genuinely hope that is the case, but we have not heard, I, I think, um, um, enough sufficiently, and that's for members to discuss when we, we go into closed session, about what was done over that period before you guys came into office. Um, and 
it is very clear to me that whenever these contracts were negotiated, the skill set was not there. Whenever we came to managing them, the skill set was not there. When it came to um, accounting for them, the skill set was not there. And when it came to renegotiating them, I am not convinced the skill set was there either. Um, and those are, those, are, those are issues that we as a committee we need to talk about um, in private. Um, and uh, at this stage, I suppose, uh, I would just say to either Mr Donnelly or Mr Stevenson, is there anything they want to ask uh, before uh, I invite our colleagues to leave us for the afternoon? Uh, just maybe one or two points, Chair. Um, it strikes me uh, when these large, complicated contracts um, uh, if they're up for renewal, uh, the preparation needs to be carried out almost years before. Uh, public bodies keep getting caught out over and over again with contract expiry. I suppose I am a little bit perturbed at uh, the, the rationale for doing yet another extension on land web because there wasn't enough uh, breadth to actually deal with all the contracts that needed to be renewed and the rates system was actually taking priority. That is a little bit worrying, so that suggests there's not enough capacity in the system uh, to actually deal with uh, a number of these contracts that are running out at the same time. Okay. Mr Stevenson? Is there anything you want to add? Or uh, no, I have nothing to add. I think the, the questions have been covered um, by the committee already today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so, at this stage, stage, can I just thank Ms. Gray, Mr. Duffy, Mr. Snowden for the briefing and your time taken this afternoon uh, uh, with the committee. We really appreciate that. And uh, the committee will be in contact to formally request further information after we've had discussion. Um, so, thank you very much and uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Mr. Donnelly, if you might remain. Thank you also to Mr. Stevenson. You're Free to go, sir. Okay, members. Um, you can tell. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.